<laughs> Good thing I said that before recording. <laughs> All right. Hope you guys had a nice break. You guys actually got the day off, Monday off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this fun lecture is what I'm re recording. <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> uh, I posted some notes on, uh, on Moodle. I just called them function notes because that's, I guess, what they are. So let me see here. Uh, no ability. Mm, that would be good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, ha. Yes. All right. So because this section or uh, today's stuff is uh, it's not in the textbook, I just kind of compiled it all in, in these boring to read notes. So we'll go through that today. Uh, but at least since I've typed it all out, um, there's not that much writing. It's just kind of talking about uh, more functions. And I know you guys conquered uh, the difference quotient. People didn't like it that much. I'm seeing a, a head shake. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we'll deal more with functions and... Um, oh, nice. Um, yeah, we'll deal more with functions stuffing functions inside other functions, which is basically what we're doing with the difference quotient. Um, yeah. And, um, oh yeah, so your, I, uh, your grade scope marks, I guess, are available. I haven't um, landed on something that I like. Most people's were like the web assigned grade and the grade scope grade were essentially the same. So I'm just working through that and seeing, you know, uh, there were some rare instances where uh, I want to look a little bit closer at the grade scope before committing to a grade. Uh, but in general, I mean, the web assigned grade is, is a pretty good indicator of how you did. Really good work, guys. Um, I'm really impressed. So that was really good. Um, but yeah, so and I think it did something funny because I had set it to close, but then it wasn't showing your grade. So uh, someone texted me after the test and was like, hey, am I supposed to see my grade? You should be able to see your web assigned grade now. Um, and like I said, that's a pretty good indication. I haven't uh, solidified your grades yet because I just started looking at, you know, what they look like against each other, but um, stay tuned. All right. Turducken, right? Um, <laughs> need that bonus mark. <laughs> well, I do have to incorporate those still. Um, all right. So, we're going to keep talking about functions and then um, of course we just we keep talking about functions for the rest of the course but um, later we'll move into exponential functions and logarithmic functions next week so hopefully we'll be able to work through this uh, this handout today and um, we'll see all right I feel like I need to do a little intro but we haven't really done anything since the test so here we go. All right. Um, we're going to start talking about one-to-one -one and onto functions. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of terminology. Often we, we just talk about the domain and range of a function, right, where we think about just briefly the domain is everything, uh, all our input values. 
right? So all the possible inputs, that's our domain. And then we usually think of all our possible outputs as the range. Um, we could get a little bit nitpicky. Honestly, can you get away with not worrying about the difference between the codomain and the range? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the codomain, just as simple as we can possibly talk about it, is uh, what could come out of a function, right? And then the range is what actually comes out of a function. So those two things could be a little bit different. Um, this is not something that I'm going to test you on. Uh, honestly, have I had to differentiate between the two that much in my math career? Not really, right? Um, often I'll just think of the codomain and the range as sort of interchangeable. I, I have this kind of trigger in my mind that says, ah, they're not really the same, but basically the same. Uh, so the range and the codomain are just the outputs, generally speaking. Okay. So we're gonna talk about one-to-one -one and onto functions. So um, Functions can be one-to-one, -one, they can be onto, they can be both, or they can be neither. Um, the most important one is the one-to-one -one functions. One-to-one -one functions we'll find later are invertible, and so we're able to find the inverse of them, which isn't necessarily true for all functions. Um, whereas onto is another one of those that just kind of flies under the radar. If you go deeper into math, then you'll talk about onto functions. Um, so we're just going to kind of touch down and then get out uh, of onto functions. But we will talk about one-to-one -one functions quite a bit. Okay, everything that I'm saying is already typed up, so I'm having a hard time. I don't know what to, <laughs> what to highlight here. But anyways, um, here we go. So we talked about just kind of the, the domain, the codomain, and the range. I also put a little footnote. There are two footnotes down here at the bottom um, with links to where I, where I just kind of sourced this stuff uh, or some of the stuff. So if you want to read further than you can, um, specifically for the onto stuff, the internet is not very helpful for onto, for simple onto things. And that's just because uh, we don't typically deal with onto functions. Uh, in a simple setting. So you might be disappointed with how little we talk about onto functions. But anyways, one-to-one -one functions. Um, a function, f, is one-to-one -one if and only if for all x, y, or x's and y's in a, um, uh, I didn't define A, that's my hang up. Where is A coming from? A is the domain of F, F with domain A. You can see X and Y and A, and then I said, hey, where's A coming from? A is the domain of F, which is a uh, pretty default, but uh, but I didn't say it. Uh, so if you have some X and some Y in the domain, then if you're able to show that if you set F of X equal to F of Y, then you should be able to show that X equals Y. Okay? And so things will cancel if it's one to one. Okay? And so what we do is usually I'll use A and B instead because X and Y can get, I don't know, a little bit more confusing. Uh, so what we do is that show that if F of A equals F of B, then A equals B. So I'm going to add a page here. Okay. 
and we'll work through these. Maybe I'll even, I'll reiterate what we just said. To show, oops, that a function f is one to one uh, we let f of a equal f of b to show a equals b. If we can't show that, then it's not one to one. So let's do this first one here. If f of x is negative 2x plus 4, then what we have to do is I take f of a and I set it equal to f of b. So wherever I see an x, I'm going to replace it with a and on the left-hand side and b on the right-hand side. And it seems kind of silly, um, but we'll find that it doesn't always work. So if f of a equals f of b, that means that negative 2a plus 4 must be negative 2b plus 4. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to cancel we're going to move that 4 from either side, right? It's just a matter of preference. I like to move stuff over to the left-hand side. Um, sometimes I'll mix it up. Awesome. So now we've got negative 2a plus 4 minus 4 equals negative 2b. 4 minus 4, that's going to go away. So now we've got negative 2a equals negative 2b. We divide both sides by negative 2. We find that a equals b. So now we've shown that f of x is 1 to 1. Therefore, f of x is 1 to 1. So let's do second. Make sure I'm not forgetting to do anything. Okay. Uh, the second one says f of x is x to the power of 3. Doing the same thing, right? We set f of a equal to f of b. So we have a to the 3 equals b to the 3. <clears throat> Whenever you're dealing with powers, right, you know that odd powers can yield negatives, right? And so, so they're safe. Um, but if we're taking even roots, right, to undo even powers, uh, then we end up with the positive negative because they just yield positive values if we've got po uh, even powers, right? And so we need to be careful. With the power of three, we're fine, right? Uh, so now if I take the third root of both sides, I'm left with a equals b, therefore f of x is one to one. Uh, I'll add another page. Steal it from here. Third one that we're going to look at is f of x equals x squared minus 2x. Now, this one, um, 
gets a little hokey if we start to try to do it the way we've been doing it. But as soon as you see an even power, it's not going to be one to one, right? Because even powers yield this parabola, um, which we'll see in, wow, well, maybe I'll just scroll up there, right? Um, but just as a, a heads up, a function is only one to one if a uh, horizontal line, so we use the vertical line test to make sure that we have a function, right? Uh, it's only one to one if a horizontal line intersects the graph. Um, a function is one to one if and only if a horizontal line I'm stating falsities. If a horizontal line How do I fix this? It shouldn't uh, intersect it more than once. But I've got this complicated statement. A function is one to one if and only if a horizontal line intersects the graph no more than once. It's important. <laughs> Yikes. Of all the words to skip, that's the one I chose. So for example, right, if you've got a parabola, something that looks like this, right, this is not one-to-one. -one. It's important. No more than once. Probably should have proofread my notes. No, I would have missed it anyways. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so here, um, any function involving an even power will not be one to one. So you can check it, you can uh, graph it quickly in Desmos to see what it looks like, x squared minus 2x. Oh. Oh. x squared minus 2x. Oh, now I'm all zoomed out here. If we do a horizontal line test, right, a horizontal line would intersect this more than once, and so it's not going to be one to one. We could also show it uh, just kind of algebraically, right? If we think about uh, if we let A be uh, one and B be negative one. Right. Then we can show, we could show that f of a equals f of b, but a does not equal b, therefore it's not one to one. Usually, as soon as you see uh, an even power, right, you're going to know that you can pull out this kind of positive negative um, values and plug them in and then show kind of by contradiction, because it's, it's, it can be really difficult to show that something like this, just plugging in f of a equals f of b and working it out. 
Um, but if you just remember, you take a positive value and its negative counterpart, and then you just argue that, well, if I plug these in, I get the same number, um, but it's not going to be one to one. So let's see here. So you can use the horizontal line test if you're not sure, right? If you've landed on something being one to one, but you just want to make sure, then you can graph it quickly in Desmos and make sure that a horizontal line would only cross this thing at one point. I really got to fix those notes. <laughs> All right. So we'll come back to one to one functions. Like we said here, um, a function is only invertible if it is one to one, right? So later, what you'll see is uh, I'll ask you, okay, find the inverse. But the first thing you would have to do is show that it's one to one. So show that this function is one-to-one -one, and then you find the inverse, okay? Because it's only invertible if it's one-to-one. -one. We haven't talked about the inverse yet, um, but that's what we're leading into. So we will come back to showing that things are one-to-one -one, or maybe not. Um, but of course, if I ask you to find the inverse, it's gonna be one-to-one. -one. So it's one of those things that you just need to, to work through. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> On to functions, these two are kind of the simplest uh, definitions of on to functions that I could find. They're not great still, uh, but if A is the domain and B is the codomain, right? So possible inputs, possible outputs of a function F, we say that F is on to if F of A, which is the range of A, right? is equal to B, right? So this is the only part where we kind of think about the range versus the codomain. Uh, the range is what actually comes out of a function, and then the codomain is what could possibly come out of a function. So where were we? Oh yeah. Um, if F of A, which is the range of A, is equal to B, which is the codomain of the function, Right, so if the range, so if all the possible outputs are the same as the actual outputs, then you have an onto function. Okay. So, or a little bit more mathy, a function f, and then we haven't seen this notation before, but uh, that maps from a to b. Uh, maps from a, I need a smaller, because I zoomed in. Maps from a to b. <laughs> Is on to b, on to b. Uh, if and only if for all W and B, so all elements in, uh, in the outputs, there exists some X, so some element in A, so some element in the domain, such that F of X equals W. Okay. Now, there are lots of different ways that you could go and do these huge proofs. Um, a lot of the time, you're going to end up doing a, a proof by contradiction but we're not even gonna go that far, right? So uh, what we've talked about here for onto functions, I would say is plenty, um, but there is a little, where did I put that footnote? <laughs> oh yeah, here it uh, is the second footnote because I stole this from a, a blurb. This is the only one that I kind of liked 
And so there is more, uh, there are more problems, more detailed problems, but for us, no. We've talked about it after this, after these messages. Okay. Uh, one thing that's kind of good to know is that if the cardinality of A is not equal to the cardinality of B, right, so if they don't have the same number of elements, then it's impossible for the function to be on two. Okay? Because what we're saying is that uh, for each element in the outputs, right, we have to have an element in the domain or the inputs um, that yields that output. So everything has to map onto something in the range. Okay. So this is kind of a, a good to know, oops, um, check-in point, right? So this one, you could use it to say, okay, well, if I know the cardinality of A and I know the cardinality of B, if I ask you, hey, could this thing be on to? If they're not the same, if the cardinalities are not the same, then no, it's impossible for this function to be, to be on to. So likely that's how I'll get you to kind of incorporate whether it's on to or not, okay? So maybe I'll do a little. Box around that. So then this is the one I stole because it's the only one that's really kind of nice to think about and really shows what it means to be one to one and what it means to be on to. Uh, so give, and we don't have to give examples. I've got the example down here just so we can look at it. Uh, so give an example of sets A, B, and C and functions. So function F is going to take from A and map to B and then G is going to take from B and map to C which satisfy these conditions. So the first condition is that F is one to one, but not on to, right? So mapping from A to B has to be one to one, uh, but it can't be on to. Okay? And then the second condition is that G is on to, but not one to one. So let's have a look at these and just kind of see what's going on. Put these down below here. <clears throat> so the example that we have is if we let A be the set of just A, B, and then B is a set of P, Q, and R, and then C is a set of X, Y, and then we've defined the function F uh, as ordered pairs, which we can totally do, um, we've kind of evolved and, and talked about functions as these big things, but here, this is the simplest version of, of defining functions, just as ordered pairs. This maps to this, this maps to this, this maps to this. And we've also defined G. So what I'm going to do is let's just, usually we kind of, we resort to these pools puddles. This is A. A has elements A and B. B has elements P, Q, and R. And then C has elements X and Y. So the function f maps from A to B. And then specifically what it's saying is that f takes from A and maps to P, and from B and maps to Q. So, one thing right here, F is one-to-one, -one, 
meaning that one input gives one output, one to one, right? Um, one input gives me one output, and I can map these. However, because R is not mapped to, it's not mapped onto, right? Then we've got this kind of rogue output that doesn't get mapped onto, so it's not onto. So when we're able to map from uh, a domain into a singular output, right? Then it's one to one. But because we've got this rogue output that's not being mapped onto, it's not onto. So let's write that here. So uh, since each element in A maps to a unique oops element in B the function is one to one But, or I should say, however, since there is no element in A that maps to R in B, right, it's not onto. But since there is no element in A, that maps to B in the set B, the function is not onto. The function is not onto. Okay. So now, maybe I'll scoot this C over a bit. Wasn't that beautiful to begin with? Well, because now I'm going to talk about G, oops, G, which takes P and maps to X, Q and maps to Y, and R and maps to Y. So, uh, G is onto, but not one to one. So it maps onto all the elements in C, right? But it's not one to one because uh, both Q and R map to Y. Yeah. Uh, no, so there won't be anything on WebAssign for it. I think I'll, I'll give you guys some, some written homework to do for it instead. Uh, I'm just thinking about, so it is on to, okay, let's, let's map it out. So G takes P and maps it to X. Q and maps it to Y and R and maps it to Y. Okay. So G maps from B to C. Okay. The reason I'm hesitating is because um, yeah, exactly. The, the cardinalities, that's what I'm having a hang up with. But Leslie sent me that. And I said, oh, that makes sense. But now we've got this example. 
Leslie, come on. <laughs> Leslie. I know. I'll blame it all on Leslie. She's not here to defend herself. Um, I'll have to, yeah. Leslie. If this is on to, I wonder if she meant by adjective, meaning it can be on to, one to one and on to at the same time. Because that can only happen if you have the same number of elements. Let's summarize this and move on with our lives. All right. So here, do a little divider here. Since both, uh, or I'll say since two elements, just so we don't have to specify, since two elements in B map to Y in C, uh, the function is not one to one. However, since each element in C is being mapped to, right? then we say it's on to. Since each element in C is mapped to, or mapped onto, if, if that kind of helps, uh, is mapped to, the function is on to. Mm. The cardinality of the domain of a surjective function is greater than or equal to the cardinality of its, okay, greater than or equal to. So, revise my. Mm -hmm. How do I revise my? notes here, less than or equal to, if the uh, domain is greater than or equal to, so here, less than or equal to, oops. Should have removed my, uh, my pink highlight. It's not such a go-to crutch anymore. Uh, now that I'm meek. Proof by contradiction. Well, here's one that's on to you. <laughs> uh, the cardinality of the domain, so that's A, or the cardinality of A, um, is greater than or equal to But what we found, right, if the cardinality of A, uh, in this case, here, the cardinality of the, the domain, so where we're mapping from, is three, and then the cardinality of the B in our case, or C here, is two. So three does not equal two, so it shouldn't be able to be on two. Uh, if the cardinality, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Michael. Cardinality of A is less than B, then it can't be onto because you'll always have this some little rogue guy here. So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna change it and steal from you guys. Where was it? Here. We'll pretend it never happened. 
Do, 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 do. Oops, then. Uh, and then I'm going to highlight that. I know. Don't look up surjective functions. Don't look up onto online. It's going to be terrible. Um, I have searched high and low for something kind of easy, bite-sized. This was the best I could come up with. Um, I don't know. It's not going to be a big player. So are we ready to move on? The one-to-one -one functions are really important. Onto functions, tank. It's good to know what it is to be onto, but um, if there's anything I want you to take away from today, it's one-to-one -one functions and they're inverses, okay? And uh, combination. Okay, so there's a couple of things, uh, but onto is not one of them. All right. Let's get away from onto. Did we finish this? We did. Okay. So, onto functions. I should say that onto functions are also called surjective functions. And one-to-one -one functions are called injective functions. I never call them these, but maybe I'm just lazy. So if you're looking things up, if they're both, they're called bijective. But... <clears throat> okay. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of today, shall we? Combining functions uh, and finding inverses, okay? So we're going to start by just algebra using functions. So we can do algebra with functions. Uh, and for the most part, it's pretty basic. Here, I've incorporated the domain. I think we've talked about the domain a little bit, right? We can't divide by zero. We can't take the square root of a negative number, those things, right? And so um, if we let f and g be functions with domains a and b, respectively, obviously, um, then if we want to find f plus g of x, well, that's just f of x plus g of x. So you just add up your functions, and then you have a new function, f plus g of x. Um, so algebraically, these functions behave exactly like you want them to behave, right? Uh, f plus g of x is f of x plus g of x. f minus g of x is f of x minus g of x, right? But you're combining these functions to create new functions, often bigger functions. Um, and then if we have a is the domain of f and b is the domain of g, then the combination of these two is going to be, so the domain of these things in general is going to be the overlap of A and B, right? So only where they overlap, uh, that's going to be your new domain. The only time where that doesn't, you know, quite follow suit and it makes sense if you have a look at it is if you're looking at F over G of X, right? That's F of X divided by G of X. Um, but now you're dividing by g of x. Remember, we can't divide by zero. And so we have the same domain, the intersection of a and b, right, as long as g of x does not equal zero. So you have to also pull out wherever g of x equals zero. Okay. So <clears throat> let's do some of these problems. Um, hmm. 
I'm not loving this whole multi page within here. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start grabbing this copy, paste. I guess I have been doing that. So what we want to do is I've just given you two functions. Um, or two sets of functions, f of x and g of x times two. And we're just gonna go through and find f plus g, f minus g, f times g, f over g, and their domains, just to get in the habit of looking at the domains. Uh, but we're not gonna focus a lot on the domains. The domains can be kind of tricky sometimes. Um, but remember that domains, right? Uh, we can't divide by zero and we can't take the square root of a negative number. Once we get into logs, we'll have some more conditions, but these are the ones that we need to keep track of right now. So just looking at the first set of functions here, this is a polynomial, x squared plus 2x, and then we've got 3x squared minus 1. That's another polynomial. Polynomials have a domain of all real numbers. You can put in any number that you want, um, and it's all safe. So here, number 1, f of x equals x squared plus 2x and g of x equals 3x squared minus 1. I'll make a note here, all polynomials have domain a set of real numbers. So any number that you want to put in there is allowed. So if we look at, okay, well, here's a polynomial, here's another polynomial. If each of these has a domain of the set of real numbers and we're looking at the intersection of these two, well, the intersection is also going to be the set of real numbers, right? And so uh, if we let, let A be the domain of f of x, right, then a is uh, the set of x's in real numbers. If you want to get, I guess I could get even fancier, set of x such that x is in the set of real numbers. And then if we let B be the domain of G of X, well, then of course B is the set of X's such that X is in the set of real numbers as well. Just so we can find uh, the intersection of these two, Right, A and B, the intersection of the set of real numbers and the set of real numbers is the set of real numbers. So nothing crazy there. It's the set of X's such that X is in the set of real numbers. So this is the domain for a lot of these, right? Uh, it's way up in on the other page of the notes, but the domain for f plus g, f minus g, and f times g, they're all a and b, so the intersection of a and b. So this is going to be the domain for the first three. And then the only thing that changes is for f over g, we have to also add in the condition that uh, g can't be zero. All right.
So let's go ahead and find, um, I'm just gonna copy these so that I have them on the same page. Think. F plus G of X is F of X plus G of X. which is, and I am gonna really use a lot of brackets here, right, because I wanna make sure that I show myself that, okay, this is one thing, this is another thing, just like we did with those different quotients, right, here's my f of x plus h, here's my f of x, right, and so same idea. In fact, I might, might even throw in some square brackets. Ooh. Plus three X squared minus one. Oh. Which puts us at X squared plus three X squared because the brackets aren't actually doing anything. Four uh, X squared plus two X minus one. Do the same thing with f minus g of x, which is just f of x minus g of x. So far, nothing crazy going on here. Oh, but I will make a note here that the domain is a and b from up here that we just showed. So just because I'm running out of room here, I'll just say A and B because we've already shown it. F of X minus G of X is gonna be same thing, but X squared plus two X minus three X squared minus one. Use those brackets here, right? X squared minus three X puts me at negative two X squared plus two X plus one. Now I've got new functions, right? And that's the whole idea of combining functions, getting new functions, different functions. Here, the domain is a, the intersection of A and B. <clears throat> <laughs> f g of x is f of x times g of x. And again, I'm just going to sneak these. Whee! You know what? about it. F of X times G of X. Brackets again, X squared plus two X times three X squared minus one. Here, we're gonna have to expand this thing, right? X squared times three X squared is 3x to the fourth minus x squared plus 6x to the three minus 2x. And just out of habit, I'm going to write this one with, uh, with the powers decreasing because that's what we usually, how we usually write polynomials, 3x to the fourth plus 6x to the three minus x squared minus 2x and from before, we know that the domain is also going to be the intersection of A and B. <clears throat> Grand finale. F over G of X is F of X over G of X could get pretty big, right? If you've got a fraction over a fraction, like in the next um, 
next problem that's on there. You just need to keep your cool, keep your wits about you. Uh, for this one, it's not so bad, right? Because we've got, you know, where are these functions that I'm looking at? There they are. X squared plus 2x is my f of x, and my g of x is 3x squared minus 1. I guess I could pull out a common x here. I'm not really going to bother. There's nothing that I can, I don't see any, uh, any factors that I could cancel, so I think I'm actually done here. Um, however, for the domain, the domain here is A and B uh, excluding values where g of x equals zero, right? Can't divide by zero. We can't divide by zero. Okay. So we need to find where g of x equals zero. g of x equals zero is if three x squared minus one equals zero. Okay. If I'm solving for x values that make this happen, right, 3x squared equals 1. You can divide the 3 by both on both sides. x squared is 1 over 3. Here's where we need to be careful, right? If I take the square root, then um, if I'm working backwards, right, I've got x is the plus minus square root of 1 over 3. Because if I square the negative square root of 1 over 3, it's going to be the same as um, squaring the positive square root of 1 over 3. So therefore, the domain is going to be the set of x such that x is in the set of real numbers, but also so that x is not equal to plus minus the square root of 1 over 3. What are we doing for? The second one, so the second of these problems that are on here, I'll leave for you guys to practice, but I'll, I'll post the, I'll bake it into the notes, the solutions. I've got them here, but they're really messy. Uh, so I'll post them with the notes, but, um, oh yeah, words. Do, 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 do. do you mean here where it describes all these? So algebra of functions is, is pretty straightforward, I would say. Uh, so I want to get into function composition instead of doing that other example. But like I said, I'll, when I post the notes, I'll have the example baked in. Awesome. So, Mm -hmm. um, two. Not done in class, just leaving myself some room here. I'll 
do this one before I post the notes. Hopefully I remember. Um, okay. Function composition is kind of the, the main event of kind of composing and combining functions. So algebraically, it's easy, I would say. Uh, function composition can take a, a little bit more effort. So that's why I want to get there. So if we have two functions, f and g, then the composite function, which is just f, and then it's, a, it's an empty circle, g, which is f composed with g, but I actually usually end up reading it as f of g, which is how it, it works out anyways. So this, you can read it as f composed with g right or kind of slangy if you if you will um f of g okay. slangy technically not you know correct terminology but it does work and it, and that's how i read it um so f composed with g is, um, is written like this. So we've got f composed with g of x is going to be the same as f of g of x. So wherever you see an x, you're going to replace it with g of x, which itself is going to be a function. Right? And so um, what we've got here, right, we can find f composed with g. Right, that's plugging G into F. We can find G composed with F. That's plugging F into G. We can even compose um, the same function into itself. So F composed with F is going to yield yet another function. Right, Same G composed with G, it gives us a different function. So it's just a way of getting these different functions. And so um, let's go ahead and do these, shall we? Uh, I'll put it down here. Now I'm aiming to have time to do all of it. F of x is x squared and g of x is x plus one, because I want to do both. So function composition, once you get the hang of it, and once you've done a, a few of them, then it's not going to be that bad, right? But uh, at least initially, it can be a little, little bit of a mind bender. So if we're finding f composed with g of x, that's the same as f of g of x if if it helps you to think about it this way, right? Which for me, this is how I think about it, right? Because I want to see that, okay, in place of X, I'm going to plug in G of X. So here in F of X, right? If I'm replacing X with G of X, wherever I see an X, I'm going to have to replace it with X plus one. So here, this becomes, x plus 1 squared. Right. g of x inside f of x. g composed with f of x is g of f of x. Yeah. So, doing the same thing now, right? Wherever I see an X in G, I'm gonna replace it with F of X. And so what I've got, I've got X plus one is G of X, but I'm replacing my X with X squared. So I've got X squared plus one. Or I guess if it helps, what you could do 
is you could say um, f of g of x is going to be g of x squared. And then plug in your g of x if it helps you, right? So, or you could say g of f of x becomes, uh, sorry, g is f of x plus 1. Right, you could do it that way if you wanted to. Don't even need these brackets there. Let's see here. F composed with F of X. I just like to do F of F of X. F of F of X. Where F of X is X squared. So now wherever I see an X, I'm going to replace it with X squared. X squared squared, which is just x to the fourth. Finally, g of g of x is g of x. Sorry. Hmm, I can recover. g of g of x. <laughs> G of G of X, wherever I see an X in G of X, I'm going to replace it with X plus 1, right? So I get X plus 1 plus 1. X plus Keep trying to call my papers. Okay. How about the second one? The second one is quite a bit trickier, right? So just remember if you prefer to write it this way, that's great, then do that. Um, I personally prefer to write it this way, but you've got options. Uh, let's see here. X, uh, make sure I've got the right ones written down. Okay. If f of x is x over x plus 1 and g of x is 2x minus 1. F composed with G of X is F of G of X. Okay. So here, right, this might be where it's more helpful if you replace each X with G of X first, right? Just to kind of keep things steady because you've got two X's in here. So this becomes G of X over G of X plus one. But g of x is 2x minus one. Right? So now you're going to replace this g of x with 2x minus one. 2x minus one over 2x minus one plus one. which simplifies to 2x minus 1 over 2x minus 1 plus 1 puts me at 2x. So what if we did g composed with f of x? g composed with f 
of x is g of f of x. So now in g, 2x minus 1, I'm going to replace my x with f of x. And so I get 2 times f of x, uh, sorry, minus 1. But f of x is this fraction x over x plus 1, and then minus 1. You could put it over a common denominator. I would probably just leave it like it is. Uh, 2x over x plus 1 minus 1. Because I'm lazy. So, f composed with f of x f composed with f of x. Here we go. f of x, let me just bring down my copy. Little reminder over here what f of x is. f of x, f composed with f of x. Um, Oh, do you mean um, here? 2x. Uh, do you mean for this previous one, Dermot? Mm. Uh, 2x. I haven't tried putting it over a common denominator. Uh, 2x x minus x minus 1 is x minus 1 over x plus 1. Close, but not quite. So I'm just going to leave it like this, I think. Mm -hmm. OK, plug in f of x in place of x, in f of x, here we go. Now, uh, you could go ahead and say, okay, I've got f of x over f of x plus 1. Usually, I'll just skip to the next step, which is, usually I'll do big square brackets, x over x plus 1 over square brackets, x over x plus 1. Plus one. Right. So usually I don't write this step out, but I just want to show you where things are coming from still. So taking it slow. Um, usually I'll just skip straight to here. So that's fine if you want to do that. All right. So I've got a fraction plus a fraction. So in order to simplify things, uh, I'm going to need to find a common denominator. I'm going to use x plus 1, so I'm going to multiply this 1 by x plus 1 over x plus 1. Right? So I have x over x plus 1 all over x over x plus 1 plus 1 times x plus 1 over x plus 1 to get that common denominator. Hmm. Okay, you want to be careful though, uh, right, because you want to have this common denominator and make sure you bring this negative inside, Dermot, when you're working on it, right, because it becomes minus x plus 1, but it's minus x, and then you bring the negative inside, so it's minus x minus 1 once you break out those brackets. Probably what's going on. So here we've got x over, and in fact, I'm going to start on the fresh page here, x over x plus 1 
over x plus x plus 1 all over x plus 1. Okay. We've got a fraction over a fraction. We know what to do, right? So a fraction over a fraction, we have to flip and multiply. And so um, now that we've got these, the x plus 1s are going to cancel. So this becomes x over x plus 1 times x plus 1 over x, I guess, 2x plus 1. Because I'm multiplying here, these two are going to cancel. x plus 1 cancels with x plus 1. And so I'm, I'm left with x over 2x plus 1. Okay. And that's it. That one's quite a bit bigger, right? As soon as we've got uh, a fraction as one of our functions or both, uh, this thing gets gets pretty big, but usually you're able to, to cancel things out uh, and kind of simplify a little bit. Okay. Uh, what's the last one? G of G. Oops, g composed with g of x is g of g of x. I can, can't even remember. g of x is 2x minus 1. Remembered I should probably remove that little guy. g of x is 2x minus 1. So now, how about we do 2 g of x minus 1, which is 2 times 2x minus 1 minus 1, putting me at 4x minus 2 minus 1, 4x minus 3. Good. So where are those notes I had printed out? It's a lot of work. I Once you are kind of in the groove, um, it's not hard work. It's just really tedious and um, I like tedious. I, I like things that you know, I know what I'm doing. It's just going to take a long time. Uh, but that, maybe that's just me. But, um, but I, I like tedious things. OK. We're building up to our crescendo, our um, apex of today. Everything we've done has built up to inverses and so the inverse of a function, remember we said, okay, well, in order to be invertible, uh, the function has to be one-to-one. -one. So usually I'll get you to make sure that the function is one-to-one, -one, and then I'll ask you to find the inverse. Uh, but before we find the inverse, let's just talk about what it means to be invertible and what it means to have an inverse. So if f is one-to-one, -one, right? Uh, with domain A and range B, then its inverse function, which we denote F uh, to the power of negative 1, which is not uh, 1 over F, right? So just a quick note here. Note F to the negative 1 is the inverse of F. Um, f to the negative 1 does not equal 1 over f. Okay. 
So that's just a note. So it's the inverse of f, which is not necessarily 1 over f. And usually it's not just 1 over f. It's going to be something else. So um, what's interesting about the inverse of a function is that, OK, so if we've got a function and it has domain a and range b, then the inverse of that function is going to have domain B and range A, right? So it's going to map back and forth one to one. So we can say um, the inverse function, which is f to the negative one, or f inverse is usually how I read it, satisfies the following cancellation properties. f inverse of f of x has to equal x for any x in the domain. And then for uh, kind of the reverse has to also be true. If we have the function composed with the inverse of itself, we have to end up at x for all x is in the range. So here, this, we can work backwards is f inverse composed with the function. And then here we've got f composed with the inverse of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these cancellation properties to prove that uh, something has an inverse or is the inverse of the other function. That's where we're going to start. And then eventually what we're going to land on is I ask you, um, show the find the inverse of this thing, which means you have to show that it's one to one in order to be invertible, then you're going to find the inverse and then you're going to show me that it is the inverse using these properties, right. So if you're able to show that the inverse composed with the function is equal to x and the function composed with the inverse is also equal to x, then they're the inverse of each other. Um, and then, of course, any function, the inverse of f satisfying these equations is the inverse of f. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to show that f and g are inverses of each other. So if we just have a look at these, right, if f of x is 3x, then g of x is supposed to be the inverse of 3x, so x over 3. So we're just going to make sure that that's true. And then same thing, what looks a little bit weirder is f of x is 1 over x minus 1. And then its inverse is actually going to be 1 over x plus 1. So a little bit different, right? Uh, not just 1 over whatever. So. Let's go put it down here. to show that a function, let's say uh, g of x is the inverse of f of x, we need to show that f composed with g of x is equal to x and oops and g of f or g composed with f of x also has to equal x so often if you found the inverse right you'll be able to do the function composition and what should shake out is just your x on its own, right? So here, what we're going to show is that, and then vice versa, right? Uh, of course, f of x is the inverse of g of x, but we just have to show one way because we've essentially shown both options here. So if f of x is 3x and g of x is x over 3, well, then we've got f of x is 3x and g of x 
is x over 3. So f composed with g of x oops, is f of g of x. So now f of x is 3x, but instead of x, I'm going to have x over 3. You can keep using the g of x in there, but uh, it's just 3 times g of x, and then you replace the g of x with x, plus, uh, x over 3. So I just, I just went there. All right here, of course, 3 over 3 cancels, and so you get x, which checks out. Now we have to do the opposite, right? G composed with F also has to equal X. And then we can conclude that um, these two are inverses of each other. G composed with F of X is G of F of X, which is 3X divided by 3. And again, I'm left with X. Therefore, f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. So, if we go ahead and look at the next one, right, a little bit harder. Uh, if we've got f of x, I'm just going to steal it so I can look at it. f of x is 1 over x minus 1, and g of x is 1 over x plus 1. So, I'm going to show that f Maybe I'll just go right to it. F of G of X, oops, which is one over one over X plus one minus one. Kicking it up a notch. Right. One over one over X plus one minus one. Well, the plus one minus one goes away. So then I've got one over one over X. One I can rewrite as one over one. And then I've got a fraction over a fraction, which means I can just flip and multiply and I'm left with X. Whereas maybe I can put these kind of side by side. G of F of X is 1 over 1 over x minus 1 plus 1. Okay. Hmm. Awesome. So, uh, for this one, we can do a couple of things. What did I do here? I think simplifying this, right, as a, a fraction over a fraction. And then so I've got 1 over 1 over 1 over x minus 1. If I flip and multiply that, I'm just left with 1 times x minus 1 over 1, which is just x minus 1. So here I'm left with, oops x minus 1 plus 1, which is x. So it checks out. Okay. All right. Now we're, oh yeah. 
So we showed that F and G are inverses of each other. I'll put that, I guess. Whee! Therefore, F of X and G of X are inverses of each other. Uh, G of F of X. This one in particular, or in, uh, okay, yeah. So here, what I did, I did a little sneak attack here. One over one over one over X minus one. I can rewrite as one over one times, and then I have to flip and multiply the denominator. So I get X minus one over one but that's just going to be one times x minus one over one, which is x minus one. Sneak attack. Have you guys watched Kim's Convenience? Sneak attack. So funny. It's, um, Canadian, so. But it, it does, it is really funny. Okay, so, uh, good, good, good. So we, we're able to show that two things are inverses of each other. All that's left to do is being able to actually find the inverse of something, right? Here we've been given, okay, show that this is the inverse of this. Uh, so now all we need to be able to do is find inverses. So how to find the inverse of a one-to-one -one function? Of course, it has to be one-to-one. -one. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna write y equals f of x, fine. Then you're going to solve for x in terms of y. So usually we have y equals, you know, 2x squared plus 4. Fine. But now you're going to solve for x, and then so your function is going to be in terms of y. Then eventually you're going to interchange x and y. Once you've found what x is equal to, you're going to interchange them kind of back. And then the resulting equation is y equals the inverse of um, f of x. Okay. Another way that you can do it, sometimes what I'll do is, uh, and I actually find it more intuitive, is if I just, I write y equals f of x, but then I switch x and y's, and then I solve for y. So, or write y equals f of x, Switch x and y, so x's and y's, you'll only have one y, but then you'll make more y's when you replace the x's. So switch your x's and y's and then solve for y. Either way, right, you're solving for the variable that's inside the, the function. So, um, if you want to, you just, you're inverting things, right? You're going from and you're pulling the input and making it the output and the output becomes the input, right? So here, find the inverse of the function. So we've got two functions that we're gonna deal with. Uh, so find the inverse of the function of f after showing that it's one-to-one. -one. So first thing we have to do is we have to show that this, these two are both one-to-one. -one. Then we're going to confirm that the inverse you found is indeed the inverse, right? How do we do that? Well, we have to show that uh, f composed with the inverse is equal to x and the inverse composed with f is equal to x. And then that's what we've been building up to this whole time, right? I can't remember if I stole this already, probably. Ta-da! So, um, 
just as a quick note. Oh, congrats. Ooh. How do I decline? Sorry, guys. I don't know. It's my mom calling. <sighs> At least I have a reason to not pick up this time. Um, sometimes it stops my recording. Sorry about that, guys. Anyways, here we go. I think we're good. Hi, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> Marie. <laughs> uh, okay, so step one. First thing you have to do is show f of x is one to one. Second thing you have to do is find the inverse. Find the inverse of f of x. And then show that f composed with the inverse is equal to x and f inverse composed with the function is also equal to x, right? Showing it's one-to-one, -one, that's step one. Find the inverse, that's step two. Confirm, that's step three. So this is one of those beautiful problems that incorporates everything or pretty well everything that we've done today, right? Um, and definitely something I'll get you to do on an assignment, right? So let's work through these. I know I'm kind of running out of time, but it might be nice to save one for a review next day uh, so that we can brush up on it a little bit. So, if we have f of x is x minus 2 over x plus 2. Show f of x is 1 to 1. That's from kind of the beginning of today, right? Where we said, okay, well, if I set f of a equal to f of b, as long as I'm able to cancel stuff and it kind of rains out, um, itsy bitsy spider, no. Uh, it rains out and all you're left with is that A is equal to B, then you have a one-to-one -one function. So we've got A minus two over A plus two must be equal to B minus two over B plus two. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cross multiply these things, right? And just kind of try to simplify this thing. So usually you have to expand it, uh, make it a little bit bigger, and then you can, you can cancel things out as you go. So this becomes a minus two times b plus two, which is b minus two times a plus two multiplying over on both sides. If I expand this, right, we're gonna see some similarities here, uh, but we're just gonna make sure. So uh, A times B puts me at AB plus 2A minus 2B minus four, which is B times A, but I'm gonna write it as AB, just to highlight that this is the same thing. So AB, plus 2b minus 2a minus, that's a negative, minus 4. Usually what I do is I just shove everything over to one side. So I'll shove everything from the right-hand side over to the left-hand side. So all I'm left with is 0 here. And then I'll see what cancels out, right? So here we go. I get A, B, just rewriting everything on the left-hand side first, and then I'm gonna move all of these terms over. So A, B plus two A minus two B minus four 
minus AB minus 2B plus 2A plus 4 is equal to 0. Right. Moving everything over. Keeping track of what I'm canceling here. So negative 4 plus 4. Can get rid of those. Uh, 2B. Collecting like terms, right? I've got 2A plus 2A, so that's 4A. And then negative 2B minus 2B, so that's negative 4B. But I can cancel the AB minus AB, so let's do that. So now I've got 4A minus 4B equals 0. So what I can do is I can move this negative 4B over to the right-hand side. And so I'm left with 4a equals 4b, but if I divide these out, I've got a is 4b over 4. And now a equals b, therefore f is 1 to 1. Therefore f of x is 1 to 1. Whew. Looked like it wasn't going to happen for a little bit there, but it just kind of cancels out eventually. <clears throat> okay, so next thing we have to do is we have to find the inverse of this thing. So now we're going to find the inverse of f of x. So what we do is we write y equals f of x. Well, y equals well, what, x minus 2 over x plus 2. Okay. Now you've got two options. And, and if you've found inverses in the past, then just do whatever you used to do. So uh, usually, what I like to do is I like to just replace my x's with y's and my y's with x's, right? So I just swap them out. And so what I could do is, or we could write x equals y minus 2 over y plus 2 and solve for y. Right, or here, solve for x. Hopefully you can see that these two are, they're doing the same thing. It's just how do you like to have, um, how do you like to work? Do you like solving for x or do you like solving for y? Doesn't matter. I'll stick to this one. Doesn't matter. Can try them both. So if we have to solve for x here, then I'm going to move this x plus 2 over to the left-hand side by multiplying. So I get y times x plus 2 must be x minus 2. I'm trying to get x on its own, so that means breaking it out of this bracket, which means I have to expand this y inside. So I get yx plus y, usually we write 2y, right? 2y is x minus 2. I'm trying to solve for x, so I'm going to move everything that has an x in it to the left-hand side and everything that doesn't over to the right-hand side. So now I've got yx minus x is negative 2 minus 2y. All right, just kind of whoosh, smushing them over. So now, I can pull out a common x here, right? I can factor out an x. And so I've got x times y minus 1 is, and if you want to, you can pull out a negative 2 here. Um, doesn't really matter. Sure, negative 2 times 1 plus y. Now to solve for x, all I have to do is I have to divide both sides by y minus 1. So now I've got x is negative 2 times 1 plus y divided by y minus 1. 
You can keep it in brackets if you like. Okay. So this should be the inverse of f of x. So now, right, because we didn't switch our x's and y's, this is a function of y, right? But now we can rewrite this as the inverse of f of x is negative 2 times 1 plus x over x minus 1. Usually we just swap out the x's again. Solve for, so if you're solving for x, then now you have to swap. Swap x's and y's again. Um, swap x's and y's to find f inverse of x. So f inverse of x is negative 2 times 1 plus x over x minus 1. Which is kind of why I like this other method where you, you swap the x's and y's initially and then you solve for y because then you don't have to swap them again, right? But it doesn't matter. So now we have something that we think is the inverse. So now remember the, the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna confirm that this is the inverse by checking the function composition. So now confirm f inverse of x is indeed the inverse of f of x by finding f of the inverse of f of x has to equal x and also the inverse of f of x has to equal x. So it has to go both ways. <sighs> Nothing to it but to do it. Here we go. f of f inverse of x well, f of x was x minus 2. I better steal this here. Put that to the side there. All right. If I'm plugging in the inverse in place of x here, Right. Uh, what I get is being really, really, really careful. Negative 2 times 1 plus x over x minus 1 minus 2 over uh, oh, square bracket goes here. over the same thing, negative 2 times 1 plus x over x minus 1 plus 2. Will this shake out to be x? Yes, it will, but we need to be patient. Okay. We've got a fraction minus a number, so we have to have a common denominator, and that goes for both of these, right? So I'm gonna deal with them at the same time. So I get negative two times one plus x over x minus one minus two, and then to find that common denominator, I need to go x times x minus one over x minus one. All over negative two times one plus x over x minus 1 plus 2 
times that common denominator again, x minus one over x minus one. Okay. So I've got a common denominator here and common denominator here. So I'm gonna rewrite this again as a fraction over a fraction. And I guess I'm dealing with a page break here, so eek. what am I supposed to do? I need four lines and I've only got two. Split it across a page, no way. Here we go. Negative two times, well, sure, let's expand this a little bit as we go. Negative two times one is negative two, minus two x, minus two x plus two, all over x minus one. And that's all over negative two minus two x plus two x minus two. Oh, I hope I did this right because no, it looks good so far. Um, all over x minus one is the common denominator. Yeah, looks good. Of course, I had to do a quick run through of this one uh, for sure, and I screwed it up. Well, it was actually the, the inverse composed with the function that, that messed me up, but here we go. Now it's looking good. Uh, I've got minus two plus two that I can cancel here before I go any further, and I can collapse this negative two x minus two x to minus four x. Uh, similarly, down here, I've got negative two minus two, negative four, but minus two x plus two x is gonna cancel. But I've also got a fraction over a fraction, which I need to flip and multiply. So we've got negative four x over x minus one times x minus one over negative four. x minus one over x minus one, those are gonna cancel since I'm multiplying. And also negative four divided by negative four, all I'm left with is x, which is exactly what we needed. Phew. Okay, so that checks out. So now we need to show this was the uh, function composed with the inverse. So now we need the inverse composed with the function. And I'm gonna steal these again here. Copy function. Steal them all. Here we go. Difference quotients aren't looking half bad now, huh? All this function composition. <laughs> it's fun, we're making new functions. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, being able to find the inverse of a function and confirming that it is and making sure that you can find the inverse. It ended seven minutes ago? Why didn't anyone stop me? Guys. Yeah, I can do function compositions all day. Uh, get out of here. We'll finish this next day. <laughs> you can do the next few on your own. Sayonara, see you Monday. Have a good one. <laughs> you can. You can.
you can. <laughs> I'll end this recording. <laughs>